about the CSR, Center for Scientific Review, and also give you all a chance to have a conversation with him. So, Richard. Thank you very much, Eric. And it's uh, indeed a pleasure to uh, come and present to you uh, an update on the Center for Scientific Review. Um, it isn't very often that the President speaks about peer review, so uh, we had to feature that um, in a talk to the National Academy of Sciences uh, and in response to some recent concern about peer review expressed in Congress. I think uh, President Obama uh, very nicely defended the notion of peer review as important uh, for our ability to have the top science. Um, that was very much appreciated. Let me just uh, tell you a little bit about the CSR mission, uh, which is to see that NIH grant applications receive fair, independent, expert, and timely reviews free from inappropriate influences so NIH can fund the most promising research. Um, in 2012, CSR reviewed uh, almost 55 percent of NHGRI's grant applications. Um, there was a total of 286, which is the equivalent of one of our uh, study sections, uh, about the workload of one of our study sections. These are distributed a little bit more than one um, study section, and um, we have uh, 174 standing study sections. I'll go quickly over um, the path of applications through uh, CSR because some points are a little obscure, but most you, you as counsel would be familiar with. So all NIH extramural grant applications run through CSR. We receive all NIH applications, and they are referred from CSR to NIH institutes and centers and to scientific review, review groups, or SRGs. We review the majority, about 65 percent, of grant applications for scientific merit for NIH, but the other 35 percent or so are reviewed within the institutes and in the case of NHGRI, slightly larger fraction. We have a uh, somewhat unusual peer review process in that uh, applicants, uh, PIs, um, send in applications based either on their own initiative or on funding announcements. Uh, there is peer review either at CSR or the institutes. Those applications go through study sections where they are ranked, and then they are percentiled. So as you know, uh, percentiling normalizes the output of all of our study sections. That's an important step and is increasingly being discussed at NIH. At the IC and in front of council, the strategic goals are um, applied uh, to the decision to make awards and to decide about funding. Funding itself is a more difficult um, activity these days because of the low number of awards and the low proportion of dollars for the number of awards. Finally, we expect research to be the outcome. Um, and outcome progress to be represented by publications, and uh, we hope these ultimately will affect the public health. Within the center, 85,000 applications um, are received each year. Of those, the center um, reviews 58,000 of those. This involves 16,000 reviewers, over 230 scientific review officers and almost 1,500 review meetings a year. So this is really a factory of review. We like to think we do it well and we do it efficiently. Uh, this graphic is an overwhelming fact of life both for CSR and all the institutes these days. Um, as we all know, the, especially since the doubling of the budget, um, the, purport, the success rate has been dropping. Um, it is now at historic lows. Uh, the um, last couple of points on this graph, the last one is wrong. It should be flat um, over the 2011-2012 period at 18 percent. However, an 18 percent success rate, overall success rate, uh, conceals an important issue, and that is for any given award, the odds 
um, have fallen to approximately 10 percent uh, of, of an award coming from any given uh, application. Um, that essentially means that of our primary constituency, the scientific community, 90 percent are inherently unhappy with CSR at any given time and caused me second thoughts about accepting this position. However, um, I think we, the institute directors and myself, all believe that this is a critical role and very important for the future of science in the United States and that we all must step up to the plate when it comes to being uh, invited to serve. This applies not only to the institute directors but also to um, those who serve on review itself. They too have to suffer the consequences of this curve not only in their personal activities and in their labs, uh, but as, um, as an acquaintance of many PIs that are having, or, or friend of many PIs who are having a hard time. Some review issues that we faced early in 2013 uh, look like this. One critical thing was um, grade inflation. We were uh, seeing uh, quite a bit of inflation, especially since enhancing peer review started and the new scoring system started. As you know, the scoring system went from um, uh, 10 to 50, 100 to 500 to um, uh, 1 to 9. And uh, this is an examination of um, how uh, scores worked out to percentiles. And as you can see, in 2009, oh, do, it's hard to see the pointer, it's um, down at the bottom is 2009, October, um, and you can see the distribution of scores representing a percentile score at the top of 20, 25, and 30. Um, as you may know, um, it's rare that scores above 20 can be considered uh, for an award. Um, so uh, essentially a, a score of 7 uh, represented a score of 20, a score of 13 um, represented a score of 25, a, a percentile score of 25, and 19 a percentile score of 30. Now um, that essentially means that uh, two digits are available for, uh, for indicating within the award range out of the 1 through 9 scale. Um, this got increased over, uh, compressed over time where a, um, towards the end, a 9 represented um, a score of 20 and a 15 represented a score of 25. Um, this year we implemented some changes in order to decompress the scores and this is an indication We've gone back um, to better than 2009 decompression um, and we're not finished yet. So that now we have all of two, um, uh, um, two digits available to us and in some cases the third digit. I'll show you a little bit on how that works. In 2009 this scoring chart was developed and um, we have changed the scoring uh, chart uh, for the beginning of 2013 slightly. This is uh, felt to be a tweak, but an important tweak, because one thing that had um, become the practice in a number of review committees is that the strengths and weaknesses were treated as inverses. As you can see here, a number uh, one score is seen as exceptionally strong with essentially no weaknesses, whereas no, nine is very few strengths and numerous major weaknesses. We started to hear some reviewers say, well, this has no weaknesses, therefore I'm giving it a one. Uh, this was a, a severe distortion of the original concept of enhancing peer review in which the significance or the strengths of the application were to supposed to be score driving features, not counting weaknesses. This wasn't universally true, but it was enough true that we felt we had to make a change. Uh, and so we created this scoring chart. It actually looks more different from the other scoring chart than necessary, largely to impress upon our review committees that the scoring chart 
chart had changed. There's an emphasis on overall impact on, this, on the chart and an emphasis that you cannot get into the high category, that is a high score of one, two, or three, unless the application had major importance. Um, and, and you could get low even if you had moderate to high importance if there was, were major weaknesses. The other th point on this chart is anchoring the scoring at five, which is the, the thing in dark gray at the bottom. It turns out that a number of reviewers were thinking that a five, based on the old uh, 100 to 500 system, was an extremely bad score and were reluctant to use it. So they were essentially compressing the range from one to five. Making this point helped them spread scores more. And here is the outcome of the first round of decompression. The pink bar, the pink um, line is the one which is the most recent. It looks relatively small change, but it crosses the 50% um, uh, line of overall scores at the score of 59, which is a significant change from the old where it was crossing that line at uh, 49. Um, more importantly is what happens at the, at the 10 to 30 range and um, uh, particularly, um, uh, well, there has been about a 30% shift in the score from the, yellow, from the yellow line to the pink line. The, it's important to note that jump that occurs at 20, um, that jump is a accumulation of scores at around, at the, at the grade of 30, at the uh, merit score of, of 20, I'm sorry. And that kind of jump um, is within the gray zone of many institutes and therefore provides program staff with relatively little information. And we're working uh, on, on that particular issue. It's relatively rare. Uh, in fact, I don't know of any other um, um, uh, presentation of the preliminary impact scores. So these are the preliminary impact scores that we get um, uh, before the discussion. And you can see that the peak of this curve, well, it, one thing, it's, an, it's a, um, a skewed normal distribution. So it's skewed to the positive end of the scale. But it does indicate um, a normal distribution, which su suggests that our use of the percentile score um, as, a, as a translation of these impact scores is not uh, very helpful or accurate. You can see that the peak here is between um, 30 and 40, uh, or the scores, absolute preliminary scores of three and four. Um, this means that uh, most of the 50% um, of the application are squeezed within this range, which is not very helpful to you or to program staff. After discussion, um, it gets a little better in that the non-discussed applications on the right are 46% of the applications. And then there's a re-spreading as the discussion spreads scores um, a bit. So here the peak is, is um, still between uh, 30 and 40, but at this point, the, um, a quarter of the applications are uh, below that rather than 50% of the applications. Uh, this provides a little bit more scoring range uh, to work with and interpret for program staff. However, here's another look at the way your uh, scores uh, from reviews are coming out. You can see there are huge jumps at 10, 20, 30, 40, et cetera. Um, and those scores, uh, actually you can't, oh yes, you, the, uh, these uh, scores are on their side so they're a little harder to see. And then they, they come down. So uh, there really is a massive um, agreement uh, around 
constant scores and having that kind of agreement on review is not very helpful. Figuring out how to spread off of particularly 10, 20, and 30 um, would be helpful. Most review committees reflect that they can easily differentiate more finely than they are actually differentiating with their scores. So there remains a problem with the uh, scoring system and we are having a, um, a discussion of ranking, of going to a fr more frank ranking system um, uh, to try and address this issue. Another suggestion that has been made by a number of reviewers is, uh, would be to get the opportunity to have an, a half point uh, to create more differentiation. However, when we looked at the old 100 to 500 scale, uh, when you go back to that, you get a similar kind of peaking. So um, the grade compression that we had under the old system uh, and the inclination to agree on an in individual score that has overlap with other scores seems to be a chronic problem and we need to have another way of, of dealing with it. Diversity and fairness in peer review. As you can imagine, uh, fairness is, um, is the key hallmark, uh, the key goal of peer review and needs to be its hallmark. In uh, 2011, as I was coming on board the Ginther et al. article in Science came out uh, that showed that that though applications with strong priority scores were equally likely to be funded regardless of race, African American applicants were 10 percentage points less likely to receive NIH research funding compared to whites. Um, 10 percentage points sounds fairly innoc innocuous or small in some sense, though this was highly significant. But if you consider that for the number of African American scientists that applied uh, to NIH, um, if you look at a comparable number of, of equally of control white scientists, the African American scientists were getting 55 percent of the awards expected for the white scientists. So that 10 percentage point difference translated into a huge likelihood of success uh, difference. Some suggested explanations in that paper were the possibility of bias in peer review and a cumulative disadvantage that could be um, experienced by uh, African American scientists based on differences in education and other forms of um, uh, bias over the course of their careers. NIH was uh, extremely uh, felt that this issue was extremely important. This was important um, because NIH believes that it should be um, represent fairness for um, all groups. And the, the level of this difference um, got the attention of Francis Collins and Larry Tabak, the director and, and um, deputy director of NIH, to the extent that they immediately formed um, a set of internal uh, committees, raised this issue to the level of the advisory committee to the director of NIH, um, asked that immediate action uh, be taken, but also um, that both CSR and other groups at NIH get to the bottom of what was the cause of this discrepancy or the dis disparity. Um, so a peer review subcommittee was set up. By the way, um, we accept that this, whatever is going on, happens before award decisions are made. Um, the impact score uh, for applications entirely determines uh, the award rate. So we accept that if there's any problem in the, re uh, in the NIH system, it must be occurring within the peer review system. It is, re remains possible that there's a difference in the applications coming in. Uh, that, the advisory committee asked that a peer review subcommittee be set up. That's been done. Uh, I'm a co-chair of that committee. It asked that we provide more information for applicants who have non-discussed as their outcome. African Americans have a much, 
um, have many more applications not discussed uh, than other scientists. That's been done. Um, they asked that text analysis of application summary statements and discussions um, be looked at. They looked, asked for an evaluation of anonymized applications. And they asked for diversity awareness training of NIH staff. All of those things are um, being worked on. And we're hoping to do this as a true experimental science so that um, we can know the causes of these disparities. This is the uh, initial uh, group on the work group on diversity subcommittee on peer review. Um, it's mainly uh, social scientists uh, to try and, and look at this problem. We're also bringing on board um, other scientists with strong records on, on peer review and perhaps and more biologically oriented scientists. We have also um, increased the representation of minority groups on our study sections. Um, just since I've come on board, we've increased African Americans on CSR study sections by 42 percent and Hispanic scientists by 22 percent. Um, I show you those in, in highlight, but if you look at the rest of the chart, you can see that um, from 2006 to 2011, um, numbers had actually been declining across the board. Um, and so um, I can't do more than, than say that we've brought back the numbers to, um, uh, to a proportion that's about 10 percent right now. This is about double the, um, uh, the representation of underrepresented minority scientists uh, in the award pool of NIH. We've also created an early career reviewer program um, to help early career scientists who are just beginning uh, life as an independent researcher to understand more about the Center for Scientific Review and review. This is to train qualified scientists without significant experience, to help emerging researchers advance their careers, and to enrich the existing pool of NIH reviewers by including scientists from less research-intensive institutions. Um, the requirements for being an early career reviewer is not having reviewed for NIH before beyond one male review, um, have a faculty appointment is, um, is we are, that we are told by the university that it's expected that the individual become an investigator and that they've established an active independent research program and have not had an R01 or equivalent. Now, these individuals, there's no more than one per review panel. Um, these individuals are given a very light review load as a tertiary reviewer between two and four applications. So their primary job is to um, look and learn. Um, they are under the wing of the SRO and uh, the uh, chair of the panel. So far, we've um, nearly 700 have served on study sections. And of those, 32 percent are underrepresented minority scientists. But these include scientists from all universities um, who are considered uh, independent. Feedback so far has been very positive. Uh, 98 percent found the ECR experience to be useful. 90 percent reported themselves to be in a better position to write their own grants. 97 percent would recommend the ECR experience to a colleague. We have not been getting um, negative comments from reviewers, um, and uh, the experience of the SROs and the chairs is very positive. For um, your own information, this is how to apply to the ECR program, to CSR, Early Career Reviewer, all one word, at mail.nih.gov. You'll be given copies of my presentation if you, if you don't want to note this. CSR is also looking at additional review platforms um, as part of a general effort to try and ensure that we have appropriate review platforms for different circumstances. Uh, we're, we're trying different kinds, um, the, uh, such as telephone-assisted meetings, video-assisted discussions, internet-assisted meetings, and telepresence meetings. These are various forms of either phone, video, or completely asynchronous electronic um, reviews. We're also looking at editorial board 
uh, style meetings. We are looking at the strengths and weaknesses of these various forms, what, what kinds of reviews they are best for, uh, people's um, impressions of these forms of review compared to face-to-face, -face, our standard form of review. Uh, there's a lot of interest in editorial board style meetings since this, these have been used for the director's special um, um, application program and um, it is felt that that might be a, a style for the future but it is more expensive than regular face-to-face uh, -face review. Here's just an example of a video conference uh, based study section um, similar to telepresence this is where reviewers on both sides of the room, the ones on the back are just on video, the ones in the front are live, um, the ones in the back are, appear nearly full size so it's possible to see their expressions as, as they conduct their reviews and to see whether or not they're paying attention. Um, one of the nice things about this is that the microphones are set up so they're directional and you can, you can see the voice appearing to come from the person uh, that's speaking. It's a very nice feature of this. I'm going to shift over to an issue which has been bothering uh, many scientists and has been a source of frequent complaints to CSR and this is the issue of the A2 um, application. This is the uh, graphic that uh, convinced uh, NIH directors and NIH that um, we should address the A2 issue. Here we see that the A awards to A0s went from about six, uh, 60 percent in 1998 and it dropped to um, the lowest form of award by 2008. The A2 um, awards had risen, had passed the A0s. And you can see from the intersection um, that seemed to be looming, it was likely that it would pass the A1s um, in popularity, the proportion of wards. After um, the A2 was eliminated in 2008, uh, some applications were grandfathered, but as the grandfathering ran out, uh, those curves uh, went down. The A0 rebounded strongly as we had hoped. Um, and pass the um, A1. But you could also see, this was the, the latest results are from 2011. We're looking for 2012. I'm very concerned that A1 may, may intersect um, with the A0. But what these lines suggested was that, the, and what we heard in the actual conversations that it went on on review panels, was that a line was being set up that people were expected to wait till their A2 application before receiving an award uh, in many cases. It was very easy for the committee to um, try and pick out a few things that they wanted uh, to see get an award. They became more urgent at the A1 once they, uh, once they came to the A2 level. Um, it became a strong temptation uh, to line up PIs in order uh, of their applications. When the A2 was eliminated, the, uh, the time to funding dropped quite a bit from a little over 90 weeks to a little over 50 weeks um, on average. Um, and you, so this, these two things and the lack of difference between new investigators and established investigators, um, it was uh, through a lot of statistics, the Office of Extramural Research determined that there were no um, groups that were substantially more affected by the loss of the A2. Um, the time to award increased, uh, reduced, went down dramatically. And uh, so it was felt um, that we should eliminate the A2. Also, the order of, um, of, pr uh, of scoring seemed to hold across this period of time. So there were no dramatic changes uh, that were occurring. It was just delaying when the award um, would occur. And I want to talk a little bit about the future and then I'll, I'll take some um, of your comments. One of the ways in which um, we think we can improve uh, the outputs of uh, 
CSR our scoring is if we look at the distribution of applications across study sections. Current distribution is quite non-random. First of all, we, we base distribution on the areas of science. Uh, two, we base distribution on PI preference. Uh, PIs get to to ask for um, the study section they'd like to have, and we honor those 80% of the time, and 75% of scientists ask for a review committee. This means, and the observation of many people, um, that there may be a non-random distribution of the highest quality applications. Uh, if that's true, and, and we normalize the output of all study sections, that means that um, you are not looking um, when uh, in council and in other places, you do not get to look at um, necessarily the best applications across all the applications. You're just looking at the best applications from each study section. We are looking at how that works. We are trying to get um, establish statistics on whether or not that impression of most people is real. Uh, we are going to be scoring or re-ranking applications from a broad set of study sections to try and see what the relationship of that ranking is uh, to the individual study sections. If there is consistent differences across study sections, uh, that will cause us to ask the question, how can we um, um, look more, more generally across study sections in a systematic way and provide you with the information. We're trying to develop better tools for applicants for referral and in review. This is part of a general process to try and make CSR more user friendly uh, for applicants and to make the system of award intake um, more helpful. We are also trying to increase diversity and reduce award disparities, obviously. Um, in general, we'd like to provide better service to applicants um, and to the ICs. We are trying to have more discussions with program staff uh, to see what we can do to make our summary statements the most helpful. And finally, we're trying to develop a science of peer review. We've established an office with money to do um, experiments in peer review. Uh, I've implied some of those ideas uh, to you earlier in this talk. But I think if we are to um, keep the U.S. lead, um, especially in this time of difficult funding, we've got to figure out ways to make it easier to um, find the, the best applications and make awards uh, to those and to provide you through CSR with the best information for making those decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Well, he, we have time for, for questions. Uh, let me start with the first one for this, for this, I don't know, I, I forgot the exact three letters, the training one where you take youngsters and, and basically the give them. Early Career Reviewer yeah. Program, is, ECR. Do you, do you have, what's the curriculum that you give to them? Is it, is it purely just by showing up or do you have materials or mock study sections or other things that one could imagine you could do? We don't go to mock study sections. What we do is the, um, each ECR is given um, both a PowerPoint set plus a training from the SRO. Um, and then they're given guidance. They can't attend peer review more than two full sessions. Um, and then they're given guidance about how, how to work with it. So far, the reaction from the SROs and from the chairs is that has been sufficient. Um, that is the in general, the ECRs take this very seriously. They, they work very hard on the reviews that they do. They have not caused embarrassment by lack of knowledge um, around that issue. Yeah, yeah so I, I, I just wanted to share some thoughts and get your impression about um, this set of slides that you showed about the distribution of review scores. Um, because at, at some level, one is assuming that the quality of these proposals and the science that is being proposed is normally distributed. But it's not a random population of proposers. And so that assumption may be fallacious at some level. 
But also, I think, in, in my own personal experience on study section, is that there is this tension between doing a review sort of on, an, on absolute versus relative terms. Um, on the particular study section on which I served for, say, four years, at the beginning of my tenure, the overall quality of the proposals was just not very strong on absolute terms. And that's not to say there weren't some good proposals, but, um, and then being sort of forced, you know, our SRO kept saying, oh, you know, your mean is much lower than all the other study sections. And this refers to what you were talking about just at the end. On the other hand, you know, does it make sense if, for some reason, a particular batch of proposals in general is not strong to rate them on this sort of relative scale. On the other hand, if a particular batch of proposals are all very, very strong, you're naturally going to get that compression either at the top or the bottom. So I'm just wondering, you know, sort of what, what recognition there is about this you know, when you look at statistics, statistics can tell you one thing, but if you don't look at the priors, you're sort of maybe being led to a slightly false direction or strategy. So I, I'm, I'm just curious to hear what your thoughts are about Yes, um, we're not going to, do, we're not planning on doing any given thing. We, uh, right now, we observe that we have a problem, that we've long had this problem, uh, that different efforts to address the problem have systematically failed. Um, and, and that there's this broader issue of what's going on across study sections, uh, which we've never addressed. So um, we're planning on having some meetings with individuals um, who are experts in, in decision theory. Um, obviously, if this were easy, um, both corporations and NIH would have solved this uh, a long time ago. This is a deep, difficult problem. Um, and so far, we remain at the, with the idea that strong scientists, um, excellent scientists, are the best judges of, of science. Aside from that, the way to get the most maximal information from them, either as a committee or as individuals, I think there are many questions about, and that what one of the things we should be doing is exploring how we get to answers um, about that. I don't, I'm not proposing and don't plan to propose. We know the answer. Um, here's, here's what we're going to do. Um, I think what we'd like to do is to say, here is a, th a theoretically better way of approaching this. Let's try it with some study sections, um, and, and maybe within an IRG. I think we're going to have c continued discussions with the scientific community about uh, any changes uh, that we're thinking about. Yeah. I was interested in your um, actions related to the diversity issue on the application success rate. So there has been research which has shown that um, there's gender and racial bias in the review of grants. And given that knowledge, why isn't there something where you're trying to address that with the review panelists themselves? They bring it with them, their own societal stereotypes. Um, it's nice for diversity awareness training of the NIH staff, but they're not making their review the scores and the decisions for funding. It, it is the um, intent of the advisory committee to the director to address that issue with the reviewers um, if we determine that uh, there is bias in the peer review system. Um, w right now, we're running some experiments, which w we hope will show not only um, whether or not there are differences in the quality of applications, but in, uh, differences that could be attributable to bias and, um, and the proportions that that might, might account for. Um, I think we need both pieces of information to develop the right um, intervention. And so, uh, but if it turns out that there is bias in, in the peer review system, it is the intent to uh, try and train reviewers. 
the ACD asks us to take any validated system for countering bias um, and apply it first to NIH staff and then to the reviewers. However, there is no such validated system. And so the first thing we're going to do is to um, see if there's any system that can make a difference uh, with NIH staff. And there's about 500 staff that we could apply this to. So uh, we, there are reasonably large numbers. So I was very taken by the figure that you had with the spikes of the priority scores. Can Many you give are, us yeah. a sense of what causes that underlying phenomenon and the degree to which the kind of group dynamics of the study section end up congealing scores on those and what that might be telling you about the underlying review process? Um, there's no question that there's a strong temptation once the general agreement is, um, seems to be existing on com uh, review committee that an application is in the award domain. Remember, we score based, uh, initially, um, we group based on preliminary scores. So when the first few reviews they know are in the possible award range. It looks like there's a, just a strong group temptation to uh, agree on a score and to every, have everyone vote that in many cases. Um, and it's mainly those that vote outside the range that cause differentiation uh, among the scores. That's a tough position for individuals to take uh, on many committees. So um, we, we think it's a severe problem, a serious problem. The scientists themselves, they, they can differentiate better uh, than the committee scores reflect. Um, but um, uh, we haven't figured out a way to get that expression. And this is one of the reasons for discussion of ranking systems. So, so sorry, just as a follow-up, is that because, say, the high and the low are 2.3 and 2.5, and so everyone has to vote in that range, or? No. Remember that um, the uh, primary re reviewers give scores of one, two, or three. They only have those three digits to work with. So um, one is heavily discouraged by the system, and so you're talking about two and three, and they know that if you want to stay out of the gray zone, it has to be below two. So given those, um, uh, committees easily get stuck um, on a consensus. So, right, sorry, it used to be you could give the decimal. Now it's like two and two. You cannot give the decimal. So everyone votes two. And how many scores go into a priority score? Um, the overall priority score is based usually on 20 scores that are generated around the So community. even though you have 20 scores, you're still getting these If the, if spikes the three of, reviewers I mean, that's, say that's actually hard to gerrymander that way. <laughs> you have to work really hard to come up with a system that ends up with those optimal. We have a problem. I wanted to follow up a little bit on the um, idea that Jill was introducing earlier of um, what's the assumption and what might be the implications of trying to standardize things across study sections. And um, in particular, I, uh, you made a comment that rare that scores above 20 can be considered for an award. And I'm thinking of the, um, the societal and ethical uh, issues and research study section that was formed uh, to bring the research ethics and the LC uh, together. And traditionally, I think it's well recognized that those scores have always been um, high in the sense of bad, um, uh, remarkably so compared to other, um, other study sections. And that's just the way that study section scores. So um, I guess my question is, how would you handle something like that? And I understand what you said earlier, that you don't have a solution yet. You're looking into it. But as a related question to that, then I guess when you've created, and I don't know whether there were other study sections that got merged, presumably there were, when you've looked at the experience of uh, the disciplines that came in or the groups that came in and were merged into a new study section, have you traced at all how, how those applications have fared and um, is that something that you have done at, at the study section level and how would you handle that going forward? We do do um, some tracing. Most of the tracing is based on concerns or complaints by subsections of committees. So whenever we hear a subgroup complain about the outcomes of mergers, et cetera, we do uh, look at that kind of issue. But I'll remind you that today, because of the huge drop in awards, 
every group is saying we've been selected out for um, loss of funding. And we very rarely statistically see that difference um, when we look at it. Everyone is losing money these days, and we're not picking on any uh, one group. But everyone seems to have the impression that they must be picked on because so many of their compatriots are losing funding. So I, I'm uh, glad you're taking a science-based approach and trying to use actual data. That's Thanks. wonderful. Um, one of the things with the Internet Assisted Review is there's at least some level of the scoring that's, that's locked in prior to the actual in-person visit. And I'm wondering if you've looked at that data, you know, the, the pre and post, uh, to see how well does the, the uh, scoring in isolation reflect what happens after the group dynamics. And really where I'm going is can we get to the point where we don't have to have in-person at all, even though I really enjoy it? <laughs> <laughs> We are asking the question, what does in-person contribute? What does, is, is there a socialization process that's important um, in peer review? Um, I can't tell you what the answer is. There's a lot of myth in peer review, obviously, as well as the possibilities of science. And, and we want to systematically explore this. Some of the methods allow us to know, to determine in the long run whether or not electronic review is, is the equivalent of face-to-face -face review. Uh, Richard, do you, do you actually have funding to carry out controlled experiments? Um, yes, in two ways. Um, I have been uh, allowed to keep some money we've saved through electronic review. Um, a, a small amount of money, and we've also been given extra money to carry out the experiments in bias um, and studies in bias uh, by NIH. So um, I think if we get results which help clarify what we need to do to improve quality of peer review, um, the institutes and Francis will give us money for that. I, I think everyone agrees that, that corporate America believes that you need to have resources like that and experiments like that in order to improve quality. And so uh, we hope we will be able to do that ourselves. I just want to just make a comment that I do think the social aspects of it have big impact. And I just was on a review pretty recently, and the scores before we all met together were significantly different than when we were, were together. And there were good reasons and bad reasons for that. So the good ones were they were maybe someone could clarify some technical issue that someone else didn't understand. But then it also comes down to who was better at persuading the rest of the group to go one way or the other. Or if we don't score it well enough, it's not going to get funded. And, and there were so many statements in there that were like, <laughs> could sway it one way or the other so easily. And so I do think it's very important to have this decision making expert or uh, yeah, to advise you. I, I agree. Um, that there are lots of different dynamics that are going on that we have to understand. We are doing some studies of the shift in scoring that occurs and the scoring that differences that occur on different committees. Some committees basically stay with the original scores and some committees shift quite a bit. So, um, and the, it's up to you, the, the staff of the institute and of council to make decisions about what's important based on the mission of the institute. And uh, so you can ignore the scores. It's difficult to ignore, let's say, a non-discussed, but uh, within the scored range, um, I think the general expectation is that the relevance to the Institute's mission is very important. So have there been any experiment of the system of the type where you might send some subset of applications to multiple study sections to compare what the outcome would be of the exact same application going to the system at the same time. Okay, we are discussing the possibility of, of reviewing uh, some subset of applications twice to get the reliability and validity estimates that we need for many of our other studies. You might understand that that makes a lot of people very nervous, and I have not <laughs> gotten the go-ahead yet to to do those studies, but um, we think that it is important to develop some power estimates of our system. My, my guess of that would be that there's going to be 
you know, high concordance on the things that are not discussed, right? There's a bunch of things that ultimately, you know, no study section would fund. And then there are going to be a couple of things that would score in the tens no matter what study section you would get to. And then there's going to be a whole 20 to 30 to percent that's going to be all over the place. And depending on who you send it to, would or would not have gotten scored. Yeah, I completely agree. I think most of us believe that uh, peer review system, as it's currently designed, works well when success rates are 30 to 40, um, not so well exactly. uh, when success rates yeah. are where they are. Right? That's the point, you know. That it would be important, if, if that's true, then that's important to no, know so that we could communicate that to policymakers to say that, in fact, when you're drawing down the funds, you're drawing it into a, a percentile range where, you know, sure you're funding good science, but there's a ton of great science that gets left on the table, and the only way to really secure that we're funding all the, you know, the best science and to keep U.S. competitiveness is to figure out how to drive the funding rates back up into the 25 or 30 percent rate. I agree that current funding is catastrophic. I wonder if and you probably have compared notes across the mechanisms used across different agencies for their peer review and whether they're seeing the same kind of issues that you're seeing. You know, I've served on a number of panels across DOE or NSF, and they do things quite differently and not better or worse, but I'm wondering if you look at their numbers, do you see the same trends? Um, all the agencies that I'm aware of in the United States are having a harder time uh, with funding. Um, and are seeing loss of in, in science. And at the same time, we're watching our agencies, of, um, related agencies in other countries. I was um, um, earlier, I guess last year, I was in uh, South Korea um, uh, presenting on peer review. They were extremely interested. They were frankly um, uh, feeling that we were giving them an opportunity to um, emerge as a first-class science country. Um, their a representative from their government came to report on the 2013 budget. He was deeply apologetic for the funding that he was going to announce. It was only an increase of 5 percent. And uh, so um, they, have, um, they have concluded that the um, that American success is built on science and technology and on federal funding of science and technology. And they're, uh, they're all delighted, uh, in some sense, that we've given them the opportunity to compete. So just one quick comment and, and then a, another question. You know, Didi was talking about um, <coughs> some issues around re review and, and grants that are not discussed. I, I just want to point out that the way we order grants for discussion now, if a grant, if two out of three reviewers score a grant well and there's one like wacko review, or you know, sometimes it works the other way, but um, that, that grant now, according to the ordering, will not be reviewed. In the old days, um, it used to be that these kind of outlaw outlier scoring grants would also be discussed. So I, I just want to suggest that we might think about how to go back to that. But the, the real thing I, w I wanted to mention was that I agree with you. It's really important we get the best scientists to review grants. One of the pressures on us who <laughs> have done that service is that the review panels often come very close to when we have to submit our own grants. And while there is this quasi-policy that you get some dispensation for that, that your grant submissions can be late, that does not apply to all the grants that you would submit. So if you're responding to an RFA or a PAR, you don't get any <laughs> dispensation <laughs> for that. And many of us who are experienced reviewers, and I like to think that those of us sitting around this table are reasonable scientists, we therefore have this additional pressure that we, we may have 10 grants of other people to review, and we've got to meet a deadline for our, to fund our own labs. So I, that's part of, of this 
idea of trying to get good people to review that I think it would be great to revisit that policy and how it's actually implemented. Well, I, I can tell you simply that we're, we are revisiting um, great. those policies. I'm, great. I'm glad to hear that. And um, reviewer, any individual reviewer can ask that something be discussed. And we've also asked our SROs when there are strong discrepancies in the preliminary scores to try and get some resolution, even if there's, there's not going to be a discussion, to try and get an understanding among, among the reviewers, which is the more correct score, um, and, and to have um, a, a discussion around that, it's to try and reduce the problem this causes to PIs who receive highly discrepant scores. Well, and, and this is related to the question in terms of transparency to the applicant as well as to counsel when, when it has to decide. Is there a movement towards um, including the distribution of, uh, you know, not the exact distribution, but the aggregates in the um, in critique back to the applicant, such as means, mode, standard deviation? Um, of, of the of the score, of the individual scores, um, they are provided with um, some of the uh, criterion scores that um, uh, came to that information. But um, um, I'm not quite sure what advantage that would have. I, I think that would point to outlier reviews because you would have a large standard deviation or range and you would have a means and a mode that might disagree uh, very much. Um, well, we are asking SROs to try and get some resolution of highly disparate reviews so that um, it's less confusing. Um, Richard, I wanted to ask you whether there's an ongoing program of quality assurance, quality improvement for the SROs. Or is there, is there observation, is there, presiding over these study sections, is it observed by outside people within CSR but outside of the study okay, There section? are two forms of, uh, I guess, multiple forms of observation. Obviously, uh, reviewers um, are there, we, and uh, there's a hierarchy over each SRO. We expect the IRG chief to attend many of the meetings um, run within their groups. We expect division directors to attend them. I attend maybe six to eight study sections around. So um, we also, um, each study section is observed by program staff. We hope there is better communication these days with the program staff and a better sense on the part of program that through their hierarchy, I'm very receptive to information about problems on review committees. Just the program staff often express a concern that they're actually been told you know, not to participate, that they have to stay as quiet, silent observers. During the reviews themselves, that's correct. Um, we, we want the SRO to be the federal um, lead on that. Um, between sessions, uh, I expect there to be good communication. Um, I think we've encouraged communication between program and review staff, both at the higher and at the individual uh, SRG levels. Um, I think that our um, SROs are feeling more able to work with program staff um, and to hear about problems. We're also trying to create systems so electronically it'll be easier for your program staff to follow what's going on at reviews um, of their uh, applicants. I, I just wanted to second Lucilla's point because I think it's a really good one which is that you're already collecting all this data on the scores, so even just getting a histogram back with some summary statistics of what the scores were for your grant, at least for me, would be, yeah. I'd, I'd love to see that, right? I mean, it's sort of the, the same as if you were running a course and you wanted to compare, and this would be really useful data to also have in terms of trying to figure out whether to normalize scores across study sections or not, right? You're saying that sometimes, some study sections you're not funding it's really the best, you know, all the best grants overall, you're just funding the best grants in that study section, right? So both in terms of giving that data back to 
individual PIs, but also keeping it for broader staff analysis, it would be very useful data to have. Um, and you already have it, so right? You're already collecting it. Yeah, one of the, the problems that we have on any individual level collection of data is that um, we really go out of our way to make sure that things can't be traced back to individual uh, reviewers. Even uh, the statistics that I, we kept here, we deleted all the original PI information. We collected the, the, the numbers. And each time we do these collections, we do it for a specific purpose. So I can imagine that something like this could be, could be arranged. We'd have to think about it a bit to make sure um, that the underlying confidentiality um, is, is kept. But I do, anything that we can do relatively readily like that, um, I don't, I'm, I'm willing to you, consider. If you're the PI and you're getting a histogram of your scores, right? If you get a histogram of scores and they are bimodal, right, that tells you something different than you get a histogram of scores and everyone gave you a five, yeah. right? Then you go, okay, clearly, <laughs> right, you know, I don't, I really need to rethink what I'm doing and it's either the question or, but if you get this bimodal score, you might say, well, clearly some people didn't understand it. Maybe I can address this point better or something like that. It would, I think it would also help in the discussions that the program officers have with individuals' PIs, right? Because I'm, I know I have called my program officer and said, what was the study section thinking, blah, 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 and they pointed out, look, there's no variance here, right? Then, you know, you could you know, take that to mean what, what it means. I hear you, okay. So, Carlos, even if you strip identifying information, there are scenarios where an individual could be linked to a score. We can talk about it at lunch, okay. but I think that would be the underlying. You mean the, the, an individual reviewer on the study section? I mean section? a review panel I that has see, one see. expertise and you read a written review because that person's assigned and then you see a score that's outlying over here and you say, that reviewer gave me that score. Whether it's accurate or not, it still but, opens the door. But you do get the scores from the three reviewers. Anywhere back. Yeah, exactly. you, you, get the three, you get three reviewer scores and their you know, And comments. they don't necessarily tell you what that person's final score was. But if you see the printed scores and there's an outlier, you might link it. Correct or not, you're creating social havoc in the follow-up. We'll talk at lunch. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, thank very you much. Richard. It was terrific that you could come talk to us. So thank you, Council, for a good discussion. So we will break for lunch now. Should we try for 1.15? We will reconvene at 1.15. So 55 minutes, go get your lunch. And uh, thank you for a good morning. Is it still re-diced?